Uh, so the Search Console is very powerful. It gives us a lot of data. The longer you have it active, the more data it will give you. So that's why if we set it up right now, you want to check it periodically. Uh, maybe wait a week or so for it to collect some data. You might not get data right away. We just set it up. So that's why I might check it in a week and then once a month log in to check it or sooner if you want. But if, you've, if, you, if you check on things here, you'll have a healthy site and then good traffic. So sometimes though, the built-in help is not enough. The tutorials that are here might not be that, uh, that, that user-friendly. So I'm going to show you this. Um, this is how you can call Google Tech Support. It's not obvious at all, so I'm going to show you where. Uh, we actually have to create a free AdWords account. Now AdWords is related to their whole PPC, pay per click, their whole ads thing. You know when you search on Google and you get results in ads, well, maybe not that's that's not the best example but you get ads on the side like okay cat groomer I'm looking for a cat groomer so then here we go ads here ads there ads in the map all of that stuff that's people paying to to show up on the on the search results they're uh, they're placing ads so they're paying for keywords Google has this whole AdWords system, which is out of our scope because it's not free. You are going to pay some amount of money, and it depends on your keywords, but you're going to sort of, in a sense, claim a monopoly on keywords. So when someone searches cat groomers, you're number one. Yes, it's an ad. Yes, a lot of people are very savvy and are going to skip the ads. But also, there's hundreds of millions of people that will not hundreds of millions of people that will see number one is number one. So they'll click on it and you'll get traffic. Obviously yourself, that you are a savvy person, you're probably going to skip these ads and you're going to go to the organic results. You're going to go to the organic results, which is a whole process of SEO. That's why I'm saying that if a company tells you you're going to be number one in a week, they're probably taking some of your money and creating ads. Um, and therefore you appear number one and you have a residual effect because eventually that budget will run out. And you'll have a residual effect that you'll be number one organically, which is the non-ad stuff, for a little while and then eventually you'll fall out of that place. So that's their whole AdWords system. But that's how we get our tech support because remember, money talks and you know the rest of that. So if you are setting yourself up with, a, with an AdWords account, there's going to be a tech support number. Uh, I'm going to show you briefly how that is. And no, you won't have to pay for this. You, you can just create it. And I don't think I can show it to you exactly because I've already created it and I can't do it from an uncreated site. But if we go to google.com slash AdWords, A-D-W-O-R-D-S, ad, as an advertisement, not ad as in plus AdWords. Google.com slash AdWords. There's a whole frequently asked questions. How does it work? What are the benefits? What are the costs? And basically you are putting a pool of money, let's say $10. And in those $10, you've then decided to buy a keyword, cats. Well, that keyword is going to cost you, let's say, five cents every time someone clicks on it. You're going to appear number one, number two, whatever, and then when someone clicks on it, it deducts five cents from your, from your pool of ten dollars. Well, the cat's keyword is not going to cost you five cents. It's going to cost you probably five dollars because it's such a generic word. Depending on your words, it's going to be more expensive. And depending on the competition, this is sort of like an auction because I can pay five dollars to claim cats, then my competitor pays five dollars and five cents and they got the keyword now. And then I come back and pay six dollars. Okay, now I've got the keyword. Then they come back and pay sixteen dollars. So it's a never-ending moving target. That's why these companies that appear number one set aside a budget to get those keywords. How much money do you think PetSmart has to be up on number two? Um, that's why these companies are really big up there, because they can spend that money. 
so I'm not scaring you away. I'm just saying that um, this is one way to get SEO, I, uh, SEO traffic. In the SEO class, I say at the very beginning, how many of you, raise your hand, would like to do SEO the, the easy way? People raise your hand. Okay, now take your hand and reach into your wallet, and take out their credit card, and let's buy some AdWords, some PPC, pay-per-click campaigns. Is there a way you can look and see who's the highest? Yes, definitely. Once we set this up, we'll be able to do that keyword research, and it will tell you how much it costs and everything. Definitely, also. If the word is very popular, such as coffee shop in New York, that might be a lot of people might want that. Starbucks might want that. Or, you know, Joe's Coffee might want that. So there is going to be a minimum depending on your keyword, and it'll tell you there what it is. So let's click sign in at the top right. Go ahead and sign in. Again, mine is going to look different because I've already got it set up. So I'll look over your shoulder to see what it looks like. Okay, actually, I think on this account I do have it pretty... Okay, do you see something like mine? Maybe a little different? If it looks different, that's okay. But this is the um, AdWords, Google AdWords. It took me right away over to Campaigns. And um, it's going to say, okay, let's choose your budget, create some ads, select your keywords, enter billing information, and then we'll start to rank. Well, I don't want to look at that. Um, we've got home to track our data and so forth. Do you notice there's a phone number under campaigns? There's a phone number right here, free campaign setup support call. So there's a tech support number right there. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to show the exact page that you guys are looking at because we've already, you've, I've already set it up. So, but again, this is the concept. So I can't show you exactly, but this is the concept. Again, if we create an AdWords account, we don't have to actually create an ad and fund it and all of that. But somewhere in this screen, maybe not exactly like what mine looks like, but up on tools perhaps or whatever yours looks like you'll be able to find a spot to actually get in touch with someone on tech support try this whatever it looks like do you hopefully see a gear on the top right corner if you do click on that gear and it says right there call us 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. <coughs> Eastern Time Monday through Friday there's a phone number where you can talk to someone um, so related to your related to your uh, account then you'll be able to talk to someone over at Google to help you with your AdWords or your Google Analytics and all of that. So this is the big secret. You don't have to have actual ads and so forth and campaigns and spending money, but you need an AdWords account. It comes with all of your, your 
Google stuff. So um, you call that phone number, you talk to a real person, and you get some answers. This is as much as I'll show here. I can help people individually if they really want to look at this, but um, it's over on AdWords. All right, so I'm going to shift gears now. Um, we were looking at Google um, Search Console and a couple of other things here. We're going to look at Google Analytics. Analytics is very cool because it's going to give us even more data than Search Console. Now, if we, if you, if you look up Google, if you look up Bing Webmaster Tools, um, it shows you lots of data, just like Google. But at the moment, there are two main products. Google Search Console and Google Analytics. Two sides of the same coin. And perhaps in the future they will merge them. But at the moment, they're two separate websites to visit. Whereas with Bing, it's all one website. Bing Webmaster Tools. You can see all of this data in one place. For us, we have to remember to log in once a month to Search Console to check on the health of our site and status and such. And then we're going to log into google.com slash analytics also once a month, where this will tell us all of the all of the raw details and data of your traffic and your users and your bounce rate and all of this stuff that I'll that, I'll, that I will explain. But let's go to google.com slash analytics. And on the top right it'll ask you uh, sign in to Google Analytics. So A N A L Y T I C S Analytics, and sign in on the top right corner. Again, I'm showing an account here that is all set up, so it'll look a little bit different. But I'll show you one thing in a moment. look over a shoulder to see what it looks like because it looks different. Some of you see a screen that has three steps, a pencil and then some tools and something else. So that's just telling you, let's activate Google Analytics. Click on that. I think it's a, a plain gray button on the right side. What does it say? Like sign up, maybe? So if you see the three columns of icons, click on that. Then on the next screen, do you see something like this? Website, mobile app? Does it look something like that? Did you click on the button on the top right that said something like sign up? So that's just telling you why would you want Google Analytics and so forth. Then it should take us to something that looks like this. Before we fill this in, let me back up to explain this very confusing, out of many confusing things of Google Analytics. So don't, don't change your screen, but let me show you this. As I said, I deal with a lot of clients. And so my screen eventually, your screen will look something like this. This is what my screen looks like. I've got these different folders to organize the different properties of the clients. I've got a folder which they call an account, which is very confusing. But Google calls these folders accounts. So I've got an account for this particular client, Akia Texcoco, and inside of that account, I have a property. Here I'm keeping track of the YouTube data. I might have another client like this one over here. That's the account, vmcampus.com, and then the properties. I'm keeping track of the DeviantArt website, the main website, the blog, and the YouTube. So those folders for organization, this top folder is an account. And each of these websites is a property. So let's memorize that. The big folder is the account, and the actual website is the property. 
accounts and properties. So in the VM Campus account, I've got the DeviantArt property, the main website property, the blog property, the YouTube property. The YouTube website, the blog website, the main website, the DeviantArt website. So this screen that you're looking at here, new account. So that's the, the first confusion. I thought I already created my my analytics account. No, you are creating that folder to keep track of a, of a, of a bunch of properties. So notice it in my case. I'm, I, I'm, I'm a web developer and so I need to keep track of a bunch of clients. Those are different accounts and within a client I have different properties. For yourself, most likely they're going to be the same thing. The account and the property will be the same, probably. So for example, Account name. Accounts are the topmost level of organization and contain one or more tracking IDs or properties. So here you, you can write the name of your website, not, the, not with the .com or www. Let's say I've got Victor's Bakery. I'm not going to write victorsbakery.com. I'm just going to write Victor's Bakery. This is the name of the top folder. The folder is called Victor's Bakery. The actual website, the property, is right here. Because I could be tracking Victor's blog, and I'm going to put in the address to the blog. Or maybe I'm tracking the YouTube, the YouTube channel, so I can call that Victor's YouTube, and then type the YouTube address. That's another property. I could have here Victor's main site and put in the address to the main site, victor.com. So properties are the websites, and they have a name, and then the whole thing is an account, and that has a name. Yes? I'm not getting this page. I'm outside of the one that's taking the service to add new parts. I'm not getting so you're probably looking at something like that with a bunch of admin. Okay, what you want to do is go over to the admin tab at the top right and then on this left column under account, click on whatever thing it tells you, just click on it and then at the bottom you'll see create new account. Mm -hmm. I'll show everyone that in a moment also. But we're all probably here so um, this is my Victor's Bakery account this is the main site and then the address. Here it does not matter the www or the non www, but it does matter the HTTPS or HTTP version. So I'm simply just going to type the non uh, the non www version. Doesn't matter. Industry category. The thing is that we're going to collect a lot of data. Google's going to collect a lot of data on our behalf. And we're going to want to view that data and understand it and work with it. So if we can tell it what kind of company we are, or, or website, it can help us by showing us the data the most relevant way to us. So there's no wrong answer here, but try to find a category that fits for you. So I'm going with food and drink because my website's a bakery. I'm in the Pacific time zone in the US, so I want my data in, to be timed accurately. And you have all these sharing options, which I recommend turn them all off. But what that's saying is, would you like the data that we collect on Google Analytics to be shared on other Google products, such as Google AdSense and Google uh, Plus and so forth? Would you like it to be shared anonymously for benchmarking? This is kind of new. We'll be able to, we'll be able to compare your website traffic with other websites anonymously. You can turn that on or off. If you're going to call technical support, are you going to let them see your data? They'll still be able to help you if you say no, but if you say yes, they'll be able to see more. And then also account specialists, which is 
gives Google marketing specialists and your Google sales specialists access to your Google Analytics. So these are the people also that will help you with other things, specifically sales things. So it's not a big deal to turn them all off because then they can be turned on when necessary. When you do call tech support, they will ask to see the data and then you can say yes. This benchmarking, you won't need that. If you're never going to use benchmarking, then it keep your data locked down, even though it's anonymous. This is up to you. On or off doesn't make any difference with the data. It's up to you and your philosophy of sharing your data. So if you leave them all on, great. If you turn them all off, great. If you turn some on or off, that's fine too. And on a different screen, we can turn this back on or off if we want, if we change our mind. You can set up 100 accounts. We've got 14 here. So um, again, this is more advanced, but we can track the data of our website or our app. But this is our website. Click Get Tracking ID. You need to confirm these terms of service. Just a lot of information about how you will not abuse the service and you will not use it to harass people and your privacy is important and all that good stuff. Uh, so either you accept it and move on or don't, and then we can't use it. So it's up to you. I'm going to click Accept. This changes my screen. And then here now it gives me this block of code. Just like we verified previously Webmaster Tools, the Search Console, some of us uploaded a file and some of us edit a meta tag. Right here, the only thing we can do is to edit the meta tag. Uh, so for those of you that we did the file upload, we'll need to touch base to see the best way for you. But for all of us that set up the meta tag, you're going to have to go back to the exact screen where you set your meta tag, copy this whole line of code from script to slash script, and paste it. This is your tracking code. Copy and paste it into the code of every page you want to track. So if I've got seven pages on my site, home page, about us page, contact page, product page, blah, 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 I need this code on all of my pages. The good news is a lot of us have a modern editor. Wix, Squarespace, WordPress, uh, Weebly, etc. And those rely on templates. So if I add my code to my main template, well, that'll trickle down to all of my pages. If I'm using an old method, usually HTML or Dreamweaver, we have to then add it manually. So we'll have the help time for me to help you with this, but I I'm not going to take it right now. Uh, this is something that we need to add to your site so that then it can start to track your data. During the lab time, I'll help you how to add it if you if you want to, but I still want to acclimate you more to this because this is very complicated. Before I go on, any general questions up to this point? Another confusing thing is here. I'm going to copy this, paste it to <coughs> my site, but notice there's no button then that says verify. This is just going to start to work usually takes about 24 hours for it to kick in. So if you manage to set it up today before you leave and then you get home, it'll probably still not be ready yet. Waiting a day is common. Then it'll connect to your website, start to track all of this data, and then we'll see what data I'm talking about. But I want to get us a little bit more savvy with Google Analytics because we're in this screen property in the admin tab. We've got home, reporting, customization, admin. Let's click on home at the top. And now you should have a folder, which is an account, that has a property, which is the website that we just set up. Account, property, and then the data. So when you go home and you log back into google.com slash analytics, it'll take you to this screen directly. We're going to look at this data in a moment. 
but um, at the top here we've got home reporting customization admin the home screen will show you all of your accounts and properties when we click on one it'll take us to the reporting screen which I'll detail in a moment but then the reporting screen has lots and lots and lots of stuff to look at so much stuff that we can set up customization we can set up customization to show us information quickly all the data is going to be found under reporting but if we customize we can sort of parse some of that easier and then admin let's look at admin this is another complicated screen. Three columns. Account, property, view. The account, in my case, drop-down button lists all of the accounts, all of the clients that we've created these different um, folders for. So you probably only have one. There's my Victor's Bakery. A bunch of settings here, which we'll look at. And then we've got property. This is where I remember I can create a property for the YouTube channel, the blog, the shopping cart, the main site, the Twitter, whatever. I can create different um, screens, different properties to tell me all that data. It's found under the middle one, property. We probably only will have one. And then view. We can create different views, again, to parse the data. So let me go through each of these and tell you, or the important ones, and tell you what I recommend. On the accounts column, remember, I'm recording all of these lectures, so you can always come back and, and replay these, because there's a lot here. But under account, click on account settings. Right here's where you can change the account. There's the data sharing options. The data processing amendment, um, which is related to European websites. It's account settings. User management. I currently have one user managing this data, me, because I set it up. But I can add more users here, more people to look at the data, to process the data, to work with the data. So I can add another another person give them different abilities right now read and analyze the lowest level collaborate to add more more features to edit the data to manage users so that's like the the powerful one that's to add more or to delete people so then I can uh, notify them now be careful here um, and I'm going to show you right here as a, a mistake so that you don't do it. Um, in the beginning, when my company first set this up several years ago, this wasn't quite obvious, accounts and properties and such. So here's the mistake we made that you shouldn't make. We created our PMD Interactive account. And within that account, we added the different, the different clients. And it works, but technically it's wrong. We should have created in a client an accounts a clients account and then put all their stuff in there the sad thing is at the moment you cannot change one property to another account I've talked to them on tech support they were very apologetic but they didn't have an answer you cannot move one account from one one property from one account to another account at this point and this point has been going on for probably five years so they haven't fixed it yet. They told me they're going to fix it, but it's been five years. Not that I talked to them five years ago, but when I talked to them recently, in doing my research, people have been complaining about this in the forums for five years or more. So my point of view is create an account for yourself and you put in your properties, and if you're going to manage other clients and, and such, create for them a brand new account and then manage their properties. At the moment, there's no way for us to move this one to that one, which is where it should go. And for example, again, this, this client here, it's got an empty account because we've got it in the wrong place, but it works. The best solution that the tech support uh, lady could say was, what you could do is create a new account and put in the new tracking code 
And then I said, okay, what about the existing data? Oh, the existing data will not transfer over. So it's like I can start over from here. I can add a brand new account here and start from zero and start tracking the data. And this data will still continue or I can delete it. But I cannot move this data from here all the way over here. Impossible. Maybe they'll fix it eventually. So what I'm getting at is, within this uh, user management, you can you see user management in all of these columns. And so our mistake is that if we add a client here, they will see all of these properties because we give them access on the highest level, the account the account, which would be all of these properties. So if you're going to add other people to your organization, you need to understand this because it would probably be better under the user management of the property. And we can specify which property. Let them see the data of the blog, but not the main site or the YouTube, mm -hmm. but not the blog, under the property column. And you can even go as deep as saying, let them see a particular screen, a particular view of the data here. Um, don't worry about filters yet. Uh, change history. This will give you a list of all changes that were made. And here's where you can delete that. Not the data. Technically not the data that Google has, has um, collected, but the, um, the access to it. Um, next column, property. Click on property settings. Here's where you can change these names, that's fine. Uh, here's where you can change your industry if you've got the wrong one. Uh, advanced settings, don't worry about that. Here's one that I would recommend to activate. So this is under the property. And notice when you when you click, I forgot to say that, when you, when you click on something, it, it changes to focus on that because there's so much to look at. Click that back button right there to take you back to the top level. So when you go into one of these subsections, you click this back button. So under property, property settings, at the bottom, advertising features, enable demographics and interest reports. I would recommend you turn that one on because this will give you more data about who visits your site. Google is collecting a lot of data for, from us. And then some people don't know, therefore doesn't matter. Some people do know, and they, it doesn't matter. Some people know, and it does matter. But anyway, Google is collecting this data, and if I want to see the data of, of their age and gender and all of that that they've given to Google, we can see that. That'll help us as marketers. Um, my company, again, we make a website for someone, but that's not the end. We also recommend social media, we recommend marketing, etc. Because if you've got a restaurant, just because you built a very nice restaurant and have amazing food doesn't mean anyone's going to visit unless they know about you on the radio, on TV, on Twitter, on Facebook. Marketing. So if I know that I'm getting a lot of traffic from Twitter from women of an age, I can focus my efforts to target that demographic. If I see that I have very low traffic from 18 to 25 year olds from Facebook, I can either decide, okay, I'm going to go towards that demographic to try to bring more, or I'm going to say that demographic's not working, I'm going to stop paying money to try to reach that demographic. So if I know that, that will help me. This link attribution is useful, but it's kind of complicated, so it doesn't matter if you turn it on, I'm going to leave it off. And we can connect our webmaster tools, the search console. We can connect the search console to um, analytics to share data and get a more complete picture. So I'm going to click Save at the bottom. 
again, I, I recommend the Enable Demographics and Interest Reports. I didn't change anything else. User Management, I explained that one. Tracking Info. The only one we really need to look at is the tracking code. This is where you can then come back and confirm, is this working? This is under the property, tracking info, tracking code, tracking not installed. I just set it up a few minutes ago, so I, I'm not surprised it's not working. And anyway, this is a fake site. For your site, it still probably will not work, again, for probably up to 24 hours. But this is where you come back to check, is it working? Well, can I ask, what do you paste the code in each of your pages, website pages? You're going to paste this in the head section. In the code of your site, you're going to look for the head section. You'll see a tag that says like this, head. You're going to look for something that says head. You're going to copy this whole chunk here and paste it right after head. These other options in the tracking info, don't worry about them. They're pretty advanced, not necessary. If you've got AdWords, you can link it. AdSense, AdExchange, and other products. So other Google products, you can link this together. Share the data. Remarketing, don't worry. Custom definitions, don't worry. Data import, don't worry. Social settings sounds good, but that's kind of another complicated thing. Don't worry about that one. Let me go back. Go back to the higher level. Let's look at the view settings of. Uh, let's look at the settings of the view column. Here's where you can change your time zone and such. Optional default page. I, I wouldn't really change it because. Your current homepage, I'm 99% sure, will already work. This is kind of advanced and it really, really could mess things up if you change that, so that's why it's optional. Exclude URL query parameters, don't worry about that. Currency displayed if you're selling anything on your site. What's its, um, what's its uh, currency? Bot filtering. Um, various search engines and websites have these spiders or, or bots or crawlers. These little apps that are running 24 hours a day going to every website that they can find following links. So here we can say exclude the ones that are known. So de remove the traffic from these bots that Google knows about. Obviously anyone can create a new bot and have it crawl your site so this is sort of like a a losing battle. So it's not on by default and it doesn't quite matter to turn it on. What I would recommend, it's, it's a little tricky but I'll tell you what to do, I would recommend under the site search settings turn that on. What this is doing is it's gonna give you data from when people search inside your site. So if your site itself has a search feature, let me show you an example here, this is one of this is my personal fun blog. I've got this blog and I've got this search box right here. So if I search for uh, Marvel, this is my site about comics. So if someone searches Marvel, they get a page result full of everything of Marvel. Google can track this as well to, to show you what are, the, what are the keywords that people are searching inside of your site. Not just the keywords that people are searching to find your site, what are the keywords people are using in your site? So in order for this to work, we turn this on and we have to tell it what's the query parameter. This is a WordPress site. My query parameter is the name of my site, S. WordPress, oftentimes by default, uses this sort of structure. When someone searches, it makes this address. Question mark S equals whatever keyword they searched for. So the query parameter, what is the little code in your address that marks this as a search? In WordPress, often the default is S. 
but I would check your site. Sometimes it's going to be, you know, <coughs> question Q equals the search result. I can't tell you what to write here, but I can tell you where to look. So on your site, if you've got search, do a search, look at the address, and you should be able to tell what's the search query. Sometimes it's spelled out. It says query. So it's going to be here, where it says, what's the, what is it? What's the query? In mine, it's S. That's it. Yours, it might be query. And this is the confusing part. Do I write question query equals? No. You just write what that one keyword is. So in my case, it would have been query. But in my website there, it is just S. And maybe your website works with different search software. So you can add apparently up to five. So with commas. Q query. I don't know. I'm making this up. You have to look at your website and see what it does. So now Google will keep track of what are people searching inside of my site. I can then get that information to further make informed decisions on what's working and what's not. And if you've got categories set up on your site, you can also turn on keep track of categories. You have to figure out what's your category parameter. Uh, on my site, category is spelled out. Category. That's why I'm not going to guess what it is. Sometimes it's said as cat. Cat equals comics. So I'm seeing that on my site it's using category. So on analytics, I would say that the category parameter is category. So if you don't know what this is, don't turn them on yet. Check your site. Do a plain old search. Find your query. Turn it on and add it. If you've got categories, check what that query, uh, category query is, add it, and then save it. Going, going back, back above where it says website URL, does it matter if you have the www or not? Nope. This one's not going to care. Okay. Most of the stuff in this column you're not going to need, but I'm going to recommend this one, goals. So we were looking at view settings, and now we'll look at goals. Conversions. That's a keyword that, pe that marketers use. Conversions. It's basically a goal. It's converting someone into something. So if I've got people visiting my website and I've got a button that says subscribe to my newsletter, that's a goal that I want people to do to subscribe to my newsletter. And so if I convert them if I convert them from a non-subscriber to a subscriber, that's a conversion, right? I've converted them. If I'm trying to make a sale, my conversion is sell that cupcake. So I've converted someone from a non-buyer of the cupcake into a buyer. Goals. So goals, conversions. Um, here in uh, Google Analytics, we can set up goals. We can set up tasks that we can track. How successful was it for people to subscribe to my newsletter? How successful was it that they completed my survey? How successful was it that they bought something? So this can be rather complicated. That's why there's this gallery. Import from gallery. These are conversions that people have already invented that we can just borrow and apply to my site, such as getting traffic from Twitter and Pinterest and Facebook and so forth. I'll look at one of these pre-made ones in, in just a moment, but I'm, instead I'm going to show you a manual one. If you go to New Goal, do we want to track revenue, acquisition, inquiry, engagement, or custom? And examples are revenue, reservations. Did someone sign up for a tour, a rental, or a reservation? Did someone place an order? So did they complete the purchase or pre-order? 
did someone create an account? Refer a friend, go to contact us, a phone number, etc. So there's some built-in ones here, but it, is, it doesn't encompass everything. Most of the time, we deal with the custom one because these don't exactly match up with, with many of the clients we're working with. So under custom, select custom, next step, give it a name, I'm going to say um, subscribed to newsletter. Because I can create several of these goals. I want to track how successful was it that people subscribed to my newsletter. The way to prove that is on my site, I've got the, the button that says subscribe now. And it's got a box for them to add their email. So in my site, they would type in their email and click subscribe. And then it would take them to a new screen that says thank you for subscribing. So that would be a destination. If a person reaches the thank you screen, that means they accomplish the, the goal of subscribing. So this is often the one that we use. If a user reaches a specific screen, most likely it's from a predefined process. Like if someone's going to buy something, they have to go to the shop, they have to add to the cart, they add their credit card, and then eventually they'll get a receipt, a receipt page. So again, they ended up in a destination to prove that they bought something. We can track how long has someone been on the site, how many pages they visited. If a person visits three pages on my site, that goal is complete. If they click to play a video, that goal is complete. If they get to the thanks screen, that goal is complete. Not literally thanks, that's just an example. Next step. Okay, what's the destination? If someone reaches the subscribed screen, I can be very specific, victor.com slash subscribed. If they get to that screen, the only way really to get to that screen is to follow this path. Add your email, click submit, get subscribed. If they follow that path, it's completed a goal. Case sensitive, is it this exact address or you can play with regular expressions and wild cards and so forth. So usually equals to is the one you want. Value is optional, so if you say, okay, whenever someone subscribes, that's worth a dollar. So then when we look at the charts, we will see a nice looking chart that says how much this would have potentially earned us. Funnel is the steps or are the steps that a person would be taking. I'm going to assume that it's going to be the home screen. Then they have to go to the blog screen. In the blog screen they're subscribed and if they subscribe then it'll be, I don't know, confirm, confirmation com slash, what did I call it up here, subscribed. That's the funnel. That's the process that people took to get subscribed. That's optional. Is it required? I can verify this goal and it'll try to run a quick analysis about how this would have worked. I don't really find those as useful as they could be. I would create goal. I have one, one out of 20. So I can make these different goals. I can make variations of this. I can make another goal where they don't have to go to the home page and then the contact page and then subscribe, that they go directly to subscribe, like maybe from a tweet. So I can make a, a conversion goal here based off of a tweet, a specific address, a landing page, if you've heard of that term. A landing page is a page that a person gets to from a specific sort of uh, VIP method that you can't get to that page normally from the main menu of your website that you have to come from a tweet 
you have to come from an email, you have to come from some unique place, and you land on that page, and you only get that way through the unique entry point. So I could make another conversion goal about that. How well is my how well are my tweets working? Are people following that link? The rest of these ones, um, you can look at them on your own. But those are the two big ones that I would that I would mention. What we saw under view settings and goals. Goals is going to be very valuable because again, knowledge is power. Is my, are my efforts working? Uh, is the money that I'm spending working? And as you saw me do it quickly, it makes sense. But maybe if you go over to the import gallery, you'll find a little bit more of what you're really looking for yourself. These are people making up the, the steps and sharing them for you, and then people rate them. So this one's got three stars out of 22. Maybe I can find another one similar. You know, under social, what are, there, what are people, what are people sharing? I mean, what are people giving under social that I might apply here? This one's got less reviews but higher stars. All right, so any questions on this admin, on these admin panels? If I didn't talk about it, I'm not quite going to, but anything that I did talk about, any questions? Okay, let's go over to the reporting screen. I'm going to do this with a client that has traffic just to show you what a fully set up account looks like. We have several screens on the left, dashboard, shortcuts, etc. Um, we can look at our data real time. We can look, are there any people right now on our website? Real time overview. Right now, there's one person. And uh, it takes us back in the last half hour. There were more people at that hour. Which page? The menu page in San Diego. It's real time. But then we've got audience acquisition behavior. So we can get a lot of details on the audience. Um, what's their web browser and all of that stuff. Acquisition, where did they come from? And behavior, what did they do on my site? So uh, we'll look at those, but let me back up. Audience overview. Audience overview should be the default one. And then here's where we can get all of this deep detail, but just briefly here. This is the traffic that happened within this last time period, this month. You can change your view up there. You can tell it, show me the data of this month, of two months, this year. I can compare it to the previous time period. <clears throat> So you can see that previous time period spikes on certain days and such. I can look at this by hour, by day, by week, by month. Then we get these values here, sessions. If you hover over the name of each of these things, it kind of also gives you uh, an explanation what it is. Sessions, uh, the total number of sessions. A session is the period, time, a user is actively engaged with your website. Uh, so this is basically a hit on your website. A user comes to your website to interact mm -hmm. with it. There's that number. Um, how many different users came to your website? This is actually every, every user a returning or new user, but there were almost 7,000 users in this time period. 7,000 people that came to the site. A person can come to the site more than once, that's why then we have that number higher, and then also this number, page views, because one user could look at seven pages. So that's why that's obviously much higher. 
and it tells us here, a user comes and they, on average, in this time period, they saw nearly two pages while they visited the site. And on the site they stayed a little bit more than a minute and a quarter. And there was a bounce rate of 65%. The bounce rate, as well as the, ses as well as the session duration and page dura duration, are kind of all related to each other. Let's think about it like this. This is a restaurant. If you visit a restaurant's website, what are you looking for? Any ideas? Mm -hmm. Type of food? Anything else? Photos, location. Photos, location, phone number, book a table, something. And you'll probably then, as you come back to the site, you know where to go. So you know where to go directly for the menu. You know where to go for the, for the, uh, for the specials. So your time on the site might not be that high. But let's say you're an author and you want people to read your blog posts and the, the series that you write about and so forth. People are not going to be able to read very much of what you write in one and a half minutes. So for a restaurant, that short time might not be so bad because people come to your site to do what they need. On a blogging site, that might be catastrophic. People are not staying on my site long enough to read anything, which is tied to this. If I'm a blogger and I've got 20 articles, people are not reading a lot of my articles. But here in this restaurant, they're looking at about two sites. Probably they already have the, the, order, the order Now page bookmarked on their browser, so they go directly to Order Now, that one page. And the new users that come, well, they do have to click a couple of times to find the order page. And the third part of that is the bounce rate. This is that someone visits a page on your site and then leaves that page without seeing anything else on your site. They looked at one page and then they bounced. So again, for that blogger, that might be catastrophic, a high number, 60%, 70%, 80%. It means they're only coming to look at one thing and then they leave. Well, for this, again, for this particular client, that might not be so bad. They go to the one page that they have bookmarked, they order, they leave. Done. So people ask, what's a good number for this, for all of these? There's no good number for all cases. There's a good number for your case. So if I was an author, I might want this to be down on 30%, 40%, uh, 30%, 40%, 10%. That shows that people are staying on my site for multiple screens, coupled with that. For a particular client, like a like a realtor, where they just want to get the quick information, what's your what's your contact information and all of that, then a high bounce rate might be okay. New sessions. This is new users. Seventy-seven percent of people that are coming to the site are new, so that <coughs> might be good if it's high, or it might be bad if it's high, and it might be good if it's low, and it might be bad if it's low because you might have a lot of new users but they're not buying anything. So I might have 90% new users but they're not buying anything. They don't come back. Well I might have low amount of new users because I have a clientele that keeps coming back and back and back. So whatever number you have, depending on your site, is what matters. And you can see it as a chart here. And you get all this information, language, so 75% of people visiting the site speak English, 5% seem to speak Russian, uh, then comes Spanish, Russian, Spanish, Spanish, Spanish from the US, Spanish from Mexico, uh, English from England, you can look at country, again I won't go through all of these, but we're getting traffic from US, Russia, and Mexico. That seems a little iffy, unfortunately, I have to say. I don't know why a lot of traffic from Russia is coming to a Mexican food restaurant. Mm -hmm. uh, cities, let's see, LA, San Diego, Chula Vista, Mexico. This looks really good. So this client started in Tijuana, then they came to the US in 2008, then they expanded to LA last year. So now they're getting more traffic from LA than San Diego. Knowing that, so what's the point of all of this info? Knowing all of that informs me on my tactics to what to do. I'm going to go on Twitter and I'm going to tweet targeting Los Angeles. I'm going to 
run more radio ads in Los Angeles. Or vice versa. <coughs> San Diego's falling behind. I'm going to spend a little bit more effort and time and money to target San Diego. I'm getting a residual effect from Mexico City. Great. I'm going to reach out to a Mexico City audience. Maybe I'm going to find the local Spanish language newspapers and maybe advertise there too. So the knowledge is power. This is going to give you lots of knowledge. It's up to you to do something with it. And of course, I'll <coughs> give advice. Yes? Question on knowledge. So I've got language and country is not set. Mm -hmm. Would that have to do with the settings? Um, why are we focused? All of this information is coming from the people visiting your site. So if they, on their web browser or mobile device or whatever, smart TV, don't have that set, then that's why that shows up there. Uh, did you just set this up today, or had it been set up before? No, it's been set up for a while, but the <coughs> webmaster tool is just outside today. Okay, so yeah, it's been tracking your data for a while. The not set part could be a variety of factors. You might be getting traffic from not the best sources. Because, for example, like um, I need to research this. this. I just saw this this month. I don't know why there's a lot of traffic from Russia. I don't know if suddenly there's like a cadre of Russian uh, hackers that are then visiting the site for some reason. Maybe they do want tacos, but I don't know. <laughs> but I would need to research that. I would need to see the other traffic logs and intrusion detection and such. The point is that maybe these this traffic coming from these other sites have that not set because they're they're hiding their they're hiding their tracks. I don't know. We'd have to look for uh, your particular case. But there's no way to tell them to dig into the not set? It just no. It's an anonymous thing. They, so on sort of, you have to think if it's not set, most of the time people that have it not set do it on purpose. This stuff is automatic. If you don't know, your web browser is telling every website a lot about yourself. So your web browser is telling this stuff to everyone unless you go to your settings and turn it off. So not set include incognito browsing? Yeah. People might be private browsing, incognito browsing, etc. And then I won't look at all of these, but again, what's the most popular operating system service provider? If I know that more people are coming on the Mac, then maybe I can have some special code that detects that and shows Mac users a certain thing and shows Windows users another thing. That has happened. It does happen. It's not good or bad. I'll tell you a bad example, though. There was a travel website that was keeping track of this stuff. And they saw, or they set it up, that whenever someone visited on the Safari web browser, Safari web browser is common on the Mac. So they're assuming people are visiting on the Mac. They had their code set up that when someone visited on their Mac, their, their travel prices were a little higher. Because they figured if they're rich enough to own a Mac, they're going to pay a little bit more for these travel prices. That got found out, and then they said, sorry, we fired that developer, and then put the prices back to normal. But obviously they spent they set it up for a few years or something and made a little extra money. <laughs> Knowledge is power, and what you do with that power is up to you. So you can look at all of this audience information really deep under geography and technology and all of that. But I want to show an important one here under acquisition. There's a section under acquisition, overview. They've all got an overview. So under acquisition overview, some quick charts here. Organic direct referral social. The organic search is when someone does a search on Google, keywords or whatever, and your page shows up and they clicked. So organic search. Um, there's no example here, but there's another wedge that I believe it's called paid. So if I paid for traffic, it would show that as part of the wedge. Direct. This is coming from, like I said, what if a person bookmarked a particular page? And they come directly to that page over and over. So this has got 21% traffic direct. They, they go directly to the page. They might have typed it themselves. They might have memorized. Victor.com slash buy. So I'm getting some traffic directly. It could also be like from an email. Uh, it's coming from a direct link, but I believe email gets its own, its own field. If not, it comes from direct. Referral is traffic that we, that we get from other websites. 
Twitter, Facebook, blogs, review sites, Yelp, etc. They were those other sites referred the user to our site. So 16% comes from referred. And then the last one here, specifically social. I, I misspoke, but social. So Twitter and Facebook has its own wedge now. And so this is the traffic coming from social. So most of the traffic, over 50%, 60% of the traffic to this site comes from people doing an organic search without this client paying. And it shows you the raw numbers, of course. You're going to see, you're going to be able to drill down very deep to see maps of like counties of traffic in the US. But here are some raw numbers for this time period 5,000 organic uh, sessions. So hits, 5,000 hits from organic search, 1,800 from direct, 1,400 <coughs> from referral, and 300 from social. Okay, great. Where is my traffic exactly? If we look under, open the, open the all traffic, if you open the all traffic section and go to referrals, this will tell you exactly where the traffic came from. Referrals. So I'm seeing here some spam sites are starting to creep up. Uh, for webmasters, traffic to money and traffic monetizer. So some traffic is coming from some spam sites. But then some from Yelp, San Diego Eater from Bing, the LA Times, Magic 92.5, LA Mag. This only shows you 10 at a time, but on the bottom right you can say show me more and put it at uh, 100. LA Times, LA Weekly, San Diego Magazine, Thrillist, Facebook, Chowhound. Okay, you can go even deeper. Let's say, what's, uh, what's this LA Times link? So if, I, if you click on any one of those, and then it goes deeper, it came from, from their website, from the food and drinks website, from the event field to fork, from these websites. So these are the links coming from their website, coming to our website. One hit came from this, uh, from this link on their website. You can click on that little jumping arrow to, to show us the page. So this is from the LA Times. We have no, you know, we didn't pay for this. This is, this is their, apparently their directory to show off different restaurants and such. Food and drink. Uh, there's the client right there. So on the LA, is it LA Times? LA, yeah, the LA Times, there's a link to this client on their website where it's a bunch of restaurants and such linking to the client. So people read the LA Times follow it on the on Twitter or whatever and they click a link it comes back to the site traffic in the SEO class then I talk about okay great what's again what do I do with this knowledge well one thing to do is once you find once you find other websites linking to your website a good tactic to do then is share this link on your social media I'm gonna go to that clients Facebook and share this link because then that's going to get traffic it's going to give traffic to the traffic it's i'm going to share this on the client's social media maybe even on my personal social media and then my friends and followers their friends and followers will see that link follow that link they could share that link so now that link is being shared to friends of friends and then if that link is shared more traffic back to this client so once I know who's linking to my page, I can do something about it. And one of the best ways is to then share that on social media. Or I can write a blog post and link that blog post to this page, which then links back to the site. Here's the field to fork event, September 5th. <coughs> Here's the restaurant again. So the 
backing up, then this is again, once a month we log in, we check these links, it's coming up to the time to do this. Um, the links that are positive, we then share on social media. The links that are negative, we go through the process of disavow, disavow links. We're telling Google, don't pay attention to these links. These links are bad. I can tell right away, trafficmonetizer.org traffic2money.com forwardmasters.org those are spam sites if you're not sure if it's a spam site click on it follow the link and then make a determination is it spam if you then determine it's a spam site the last thing I'll say is then you have to go to Google disavow tool and tell Google these links pointing to my site are bad disavow them don't take them into account don't let them drag down my SEO because good links that link to my site help my SEO. Bad links, what do you think they do? They hurt my SEO. So if you let a bunch of bad links point to your site, that's going to drag you down. Unfortunately, it's guilt by association. Unfortunately, it's, uh, it's guilty until proven innocent with the search engines. If you've got a lot of spam links to your site, Google's going to say, this is a spam site. Why are these bad links associating together? They're all bad. You're bad. No, you have to prove, I'm not bad. Disavow. Once you find your bad links, disavow them, and that'll help your SEO. And so there's still plenty that we can look at, but technically they stopped paying me one minute ago. So. This class is usually four weeks long. In the summer, it's short, so they gave us two weeks. We managed to cover the big things I wanted to talk about, Google Plus last time, an overview of Google Analytics, Google AdWords, Google Analytics, and you're going to look at Google Disavow. This is the advanced Google stuff. You're welcome to, remember, send me a link to replay the videos. You're welcome to take the class again. I'm going to offer it again sometime in a, in a month or two, and it'll probably be the four-week-long class. And um, it wasn't my decision to shorten it that much, but I do apologize. And if you do take it again, we'll have a little more time to talk a few more other topics. But uh, some of the things that I couldn't quite get to, I talk about in the SEO class. So we'll end the main lecture at this point.